Hello, my name is Marek Skulimowski. I'm the president of the Kosciuszko Foundation. Welcome to another episode of the Starting Poland Today talk series presented jointly by the Kosciuszko Foundation and the project on Poland, past and present. The title of today's webinar is Poland, Ukraine, from conflict and rivalry to neighborliness. A talk by Professor Norman Davies and Professor Frank Sisson. Russia's war in Ukraine began in 2014 and has continued for the past eight years. On February 24th, Russia invaded Ukraine, initiating a full-scale war and elevating the crisis to a new level. From the day one, huge, huge numbers of ordinary Poles have responded with, with astonishing generosity to more than 2 million Ukrainian refugees pouring across the, their eastern border, sending relief aid and opening their homes to thousands of people. As a na nation scared by centuries of Russian aggression, Poland has also become the main staging point for sending a flood of all forms of foreign assistance for, you, for the battling Ukrainians. As I, as I was already on the Polish-Ukrainian border, the Kosciuszko Foundation promptly stepped in within the first days of the war and launched a fundraising campaign, Help Ukraine Now. Our names, namesake's motto was for your freedom and ours. Tadeusz Kosciuszko stood for liberty for all. Our founder, Stephen Mizwa, from southeastern Poland, the region named Galicia, near Ukraine, echoed, echoed these sentiments in establishing our foundation in New York. Our primary mission will always be education and culture, but in times of despair, we must help those in pain. You can support the Ukrainian refugees by donating to the Kosciuszko Foundation. 100% of funds raised will be used for Ukrainian refugees. Let me now introduce our speakers. Professor Norman Davis, who first visited Poland in March 1962, when he was still a student in his final year at Oxford, fascinating by what he learned and by what the authorities did not want him to learn. He made the, the, he made the study of Polish history the, the starting point of his academic career. His early books, White Eagle, Red Star, The Polish-Soviet War of 1919-1920, God's Playground, A History of Poland, and The Heart of Europe and the, past, and the Past in Poland's Present, were banned from the, by, the censor, by the censorship of the Soviet bloc and long unavailable to Polish readers. As a successful historian writing in English, However, he rapidly gained a worldwide readership and devoted himself to informing the world, the world about Poland. His books have been translated into over 30 languages. Over the years, Professor Davis received many honors and distinctions. He was elected fellow of the British Academy and was awarded Order of the White Eagle, Poland's highest order. And, and the second speaker, Professor Frank Sisson, is the, the is a director of the Peter Jacek Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, professor in the Department of History, Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Alberta, and editor-in-chief of the Khrushchevsky Translation Project, the English translation of the multi-volume History of Ukraine Rus. He's the head of the, uh, of the executive committee of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium and, and a member of the editorial board of Harvard Ukrainian Studies and the East West, a journal of Ukrainian studies and the head of the advisory board of the Ukrainian program at the Harriman Institute. He has taught at the University of Alberta, Harvard University, Columbia University, Stanford University, and other institutions. Professors, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marek, for those kind words. Uh, it's for me to start. Um, uh, I think this is the sixth of uh, sixth webinar in our series on studying Poland today, 
And it's most appropriate that uh, today we're talking about Poland and Ukraine. Uh, the project which um, has already been mentioned about Poland past and present um, and the Polish Studies Foundation, uh, which is underway, has always included an important dimension about Poland and its neighbors, uh, which include, of course, um, uh, Germany uh, and Ukraine and Russia and Scandinavia and one or two other uh, countries. Um, so this uh, talk on Poland and Ukraine is very much in the main line of our interest and if anybody's thinking of making a, a donation, uh, please have a look at the website of www.polish-studies.org. Uh, um, time is very short. Uh, I, I shall talk mainly about the earlier period and Frank about uh, will carry on uh, after me. Uh, the first thing to, start, to say is historic Poland and Ukraine are not separate con, uh, concepts. Uh, for many centuries, uh, Ukraine was part of the uh, Polish orbit. In fact, uh, it was long within the Kingdom of Poland. Uh, so that Polish history and Ukrainian history are entangled together uh, from times uh, uh, very distant. Uh, the second thing to say is that uh, Ukraine was ruled um, by Poland, by the Polish kings, um, for longer than it was ruled, ever ruled by Moscow or from St. Petersburg. Uh, Kiev was captured by the pagan Lithuanians in, I think, 1362 in the 14th century. Uh, and soon after that, the Lithuanians joined with Poland to form the Jagiellonian dynasty. Uh, and that four centuries after that, uh, until the partitions of Poland, Ukraine was bound up intimately uh, with, uh, with Poland and its rulers. There are three uh, big dates uh, when Russia uh, took bites out of Ukraine, uh, 1667, 1793 to five, the partitions, and finally 1939 when Stalin swallowed the last chunk. Uh, and through those bites, uh, Ukraine, which had been entirely in the Polish sphere, passed into the Russian and Soviet sphere. Uh, now, um, I shall spend the um, next few minutes talking about uh, Ukraine's um, experiences under uh, the centuries of Polish rule. Uh, uh, I should perhaps start by saying that in those distant days, uh, the people we now know as Ukrainians didn't use that label. Uh, in English, uh, what they called themselves was Ruthenians, uh, and it was uh, only in reaction uh, to the, uh, the labels that the Russians started to call them uh, that they uh, adopted the label of Ukrainians uh, in more modern times than I'm talking about. Uh, but I think everybody's clear, Ukrainians and um, Ruthenians are uh, one and the same people. Uh, now, I've got a, a long list. I shall race through it uh, in, in five minutes, uh, but should give you some idea of the scope of influences 
uh, which made uh, Ukraine and the Ukrainians very different from, uh, from Russia. Uh, the first is the expansion of, um, of the Polish nobility uh, uh, after the middle of the 17, uh, sorry, the middle of the 16th century uh, eastwards, uh, colonizing uh, very lightly settled lands uh, and creating, as it were, a new sphere of Polish influence in, in Ukraine. Um, some people talk of this as the Polish Empire in the East. Uh, others uh, strongly oppose that. Um, it's a good job that Robert Frost is not uh, on the screen because he uh, uh, objects, I think, quite strongly to the idea of a Polish Empire. But nonetheless, Poland did expand uh, to the east. Uh, and um, although uh, many of the political decisions were voluntary, uh, the effect on the population was, um, uh, was obvious. Uh, the second thing, the second point is the Polonization of the, uh, you, the, you, the nobility in Ukraine. Uh, especially after 1600, when uh, Polish replaced Latin as the common language of Poland-Lithuania, uh, the ruling class became uh, in increasingly Polonized. And the effect of this was to make uh, the mass of Ukrainian uh, society uh, a sort of decapitated, um, uh, uneducated uh, rump, although numerically obviously uh, uh, dominant. Uh, and um, Ukrainian consciousness had to grow up among the, the, uh, the, the rural masses uh, uh, of, of the countryside. This is something which happened to many uh, European nations. It happened to the Czechs in Austria, for example, where the nobility uh, was Germanized. It, it happened uh, to the Slovaks in Hungary, where the, um, the nobility were Hungarians. And it happened in the British Isles to the, to the Welsh and the, and the Irish, uh, where the, the landed uh, classes were English, uh, but not incidentally to Scotland. Um, uh, the next very important point is the rise of the Dnieper Cossacks, who were the emblem of Ukrainian liberty uh, uh, in the uh, era of Polish control. Uh, and um, the Cossacks uh, succeeded in creating a hetmanate uh, in the central area, which lasted uh, for um, quite a long time in the 17th and 18th centuries but was uh, eventually um, uh, overturned by, uh, by Moscow. But the, the Cossacks are the, um, the champions of, um, of Ukrainian liberty under Polish rule. Uh, and uh, I just mentioned the, the, the moment in 1658, which passed, when there was a possibility of the dual Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth becoming a, a, trial, a, a triangular Polish-Lithuanian and Ukrainian Commonwealth. It didn't happen uh, and um, other things uh, took its place. Uh, next point, briefly, the introduction by the Polish kings of a large Jewish community uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, this happened in Ukraine as, uh, as in uh, other parts. Um, uh, what it did was to create a, uh, an ethnic triangle uh, of uh, Poles, Ukrainians and Jews in right across Ukraine. Uh, this sort of stereotypical uh, rural village was that of a, a Polish landowner, a Jewish settle, uh, 
nestling under the uh, the walls of the castle or the uh, the landowner's palace and the countryside inhabited by uh, Ukrainian Ruthenian peasants. Um, another point, the, the establishment uh, of Christian denominations, which were very fearful uh, of dominance from Moscow. Uh, this applied to some of the Orthodox uh, who didn't wish to re recognize the Patriots of Mo Moscow. And of course, to the Greek Catholics um, who uh, recognized the Pope as their patriot, but, ret but retained the Byzantine right. Um, but this uh, religious development in Polish times was the source of um, the severe religious persecution uh, in later centuries under Russian rule. Uh, and the last point, the uh, modification of the Ruthenian Ruski language, uh, which uh, is an East Slav language like Belarusian and um, Ukrainian and Great Russian, but is not a derivative of Russian. Russian is much more modern uh, and it's standing history on its head to say that um, Ukrainian is a dialect of, of Russian, as, as one hears quite often. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, language is different from Russian. It developed in parallel, uh, but it has considerable uh, elements of Polish in it as a result of these uh, centuries of, um, of cohabitation. Uh, I shall stop there. Uh, I was going to talk more about the consequences of the partition, but I think Frank will do that. I'll come back right at the end just to say a few words to, to round off. So over to you, Frank. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to make a presumption I'll share with you. I'm making a presumption the majority of the audience is Polish and tends to know Polish perspectives. I will be presenting then what might be seeing the other side of the coin, not because I think it's the only side, and we can go back to that in the future. I begin with a text that was written in 1720 by Samilo Velichko, the major historian of early 18th century Ukraine. It is a speech by Bogdan Kmelnitsky, supposedly given in 1652, when releasing Polish prisoners after the Battle of Batyu. Kmelnitsky is purported to say, gentlemen Poles, it seems to me that from now on we part from you forever. We will not be yours and you will not be ours. You will never be able to recompense this wrong and we will never incline towards this recompense since the source of the wrong came not from us, but from you yourselves. Now, the speech probably was never given by Kmelnitsky, uh, but what I want to emphasize in this is this is the major strain of Ukrainian historical thought from the early 18th century until the beginning of the 20th century. That is seeing 1648 as the major liberation war in Ukraine, and seeing clearly that the Poles, whoever the Poles were, were at fault and the Ukrainians were not. Indeed, a similar uh, purported speech talks about Poland and Ukraine as Cain and Abel and accuses uh, uh, Cain of having conducted murderous intent against his brother. I bring this up because it's very important, I think, for a Polish audience to remember that the major Ukrainian culture that is chosen by the modern national movement comes from the areas that revolted against the Commonwealth and withdrew from the Commonwealth and not from the Commonwealth itself, despite tremendous Polish influence on Ukrainian culture. And that it was this uh, culture which later spreads to all the Ukrainian speaking territories. Now, when we look for Polish and Ukrainian relations, and why we see major points in the pre-modern period in divergence, we tend to look at the religious divide between Eastern and Western Christianity and the decline of tolerance, at least in the beginning of the 17th century in the Polish-Lithuanian state. And we also pay attention to the social divide that Norman has already brought up. Uh, that is, if Polish culture tends to, or history discuss the Commonwealth of the nobility, 
Ukrainian historiography concentrates on the Cossacks and lower elements of the population. And therefore they evaluate the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth very differently. In the 18th century, both societies go through, that, that is the hetmanate that secedes from the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth itself goes through a period of great difficulties. Although in the early 18th century, in the Mazepin age, Ukraine has quite a flourishing political and cultural life, much of which is unacceptable to today's Russia. And the Commonwealth, of course, goes through a great revival at the end of the 18th century during the Polish Enlightenment. But above all, to look at modern relations of Poles and Ukrainians, we have to look at the period after which both the Polish political entity and the Ukrainian political entities are destroyed. And much of Polish thought in the 19th century concentrated on restoring the Polish Commonwealth of 1772. Look at a map of Ukraine and you will realize that if the Commonwealth of 1772 is restored, Ukraine is divided along the Dnieper River. That is, uh, this would have been cutting out major Ukrainian territory. And this was pointed out by the Ukrainian movement by Mikhailo Drahomanov. So the Ukrainian movement tends to be negatively or is negatively disposed towards any restoration of the Commonwealth. This does not mean that individual Ukrainians did not support it, but as a political cultural movement, it does. And in many ways, Ukrainians had double visions of both Khmelnytsky and what happened. It's Taras Shevchenko who said, we brought down the Polish Lithuanian state, but in a way brought down ourselves as well. So this was viewed at the time. And there are many attempts to bring Poles and Ukrainians together in the 19th century. Indeed, the Polish insurrection of 1861, in many ways, uh, 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 the 1860s, in many ways brings on uh, the ban against Ukrainian language by the Russian authorities who see Ukrainian language as a Polish intrigue. Uh, so the various attempts to bring the two groups together in the 19th century are not, not terribly successful. And in many ways, the core of Ukrainian-Polish relations situates in the territories that fall to the Habsburgs after 1772, an area in which, in many ways, the Habsburgs, by raising the situation of the Uniat Church and by bringing about uh, a closer equality of national cultures, in a way, are producing a, a playing field on which both the forming modern Polish national movement and modern Ukrainian national movement come into contact and in many ways into collisions. In that 19th century Galicia, Poles have to deal with the Ruthenian factor. And indeed the concept of gente rutene nazione polone, very, very popular in Polish historical thought is really a 19th century concept, a way to somehow make Ukrainians under a Polish political nation. But above all, the Polish movement faced the social question. If in Galicia, full franchise would be given to the, to the peasantry, then the Polish movement would lose control of the Eastern part of the province. And that made for great problems between the, the Ruthenian Ukrainian revival and many of the Polish political factions in Galicia. I would argue if we look at it in a long-term perspective, the answer was, the territories on which the peasantry spoke Polish or Mazurian as it was called then, were far too small for a Polish nation that was distributed across the great Commonwealth. And in the same way, areas where people, peasantry spoke Ukrainian, remember overwhelmingly the population of the 19th century is peasant in both cases, uh, were much too broad for areas in which either upper classes or cities were dominated by that group. So in a way, the Polish land was too small, the Ukrainian land, potential land too big. Now from the 20th century, I just bring to uh, for two scenarios. One of which is the Polish-Ukrainian war of 1918-19, which for the Ukrainian movement of Galicia is crossing the Rubicon, creating a Ukrainian state and seeing that state destroyed by the Poles. This been, from then on, the Polish-Ukrainian confrontation would be about forming where will the states we form have their borders. And the other scenario was one of Polish-Ukrainian alliance, 
which is formed by the Pilsudski government and the Pitlura government for Eastern Ukrainian territories. And so we have these two models of Polish-Ukrainian confrontation and reconciliation. The 20th century about which we know most about are Poland and Ukraine caught between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, two totalitarian structures. For most Ukrainians politically active, interwar Poland was viewed as the occupation of, of Ukrainian territories. We may dispute the use of the word, but this was conceptualized by them and seen very negatively. But meanwhile, their, their fate in what seemed a somewhat promising Soviet Ukraine of the 1920s ultimately becomes the horror of Stalinism, the Holodomor, and the destruction. So both Poland and Ukraine are facing in the East, Ukraine directly and Poland yet indirect, but still after the Soviet-Polish war about which uh, Professor Davies can discuss more, are facing that danger. Meanwhile, Germany, a great danger for Poland, is viewed by many Ukrainians as a revisionist power who can throw over the unfair Versailles settlement. And that becomes the reason why many Ukrainian movements move towards the right in the 1930s. This above all leads to the great horrors of World War II, the period in which both Poland and Ukraine uh, are visited by Soviet occupations, German occupations, and an internecine subtle be struggle between Poles and Ukrainians of what is to emerge after this, in which uh, on the one side, the Ukrainian movement that's moved towards the right, above all, does not want a replay of 1918-19 and, and moves towards uh, what become uh, massacres in areas that are populated by Poles in the Western areas. On the other hand, uh, uh, the Ukrainian insurgent army is, is inscribed in Ukrainian mentalities as a national liberation struggle, particularly for its heroic struggle after 1944 through the early 1950s against the Soviet occupying authorities. In contrast, Poles view the Armia Krajowa uh, as a national struggle for the restitution of the Polish state, which Ukrainians view as a colonialist imperialist group, which is trying to restore Polish illegitimate rule in the Ukrainian territories. And finally, Stalin, the evil dictator, brings this horrible resolution at the end of the war, draws a line that pleases neither side. Deportations occur of populations, some willing exodus and uh, in other ways, uh, uh, not so. And meanwhile, in World War II, the great Jewish population of both the Polish and Ukrainian territories that had been in many ways a group essential in all of social and cultural relations of both groups is destroyed. How do we get from this period of confrontation to the reconciliation of today, to the tremendous outpourings of Polish society we are seeing today for Ukrainian refugees? And I would argue in political classes for finally resolution that only by bringing together Poles and Ukrainians are both states going to be viable? We know the steps in many ways. Kultura in Paris, the work of Jerzy Gedroitz, the work of the Ukrainian diaspora in North America, Omejan Pritsak, Ihor Shuchenko, who so greeted Polish scholars uh, in periods uh, when Poland was under Soviet rule in many ways. The work of John Paul II uh, to bring again, uh, particularly on church, but also national issues, the two groups together the great admiration for solidarity, the work of Ukrainian dissidents who paid attention to culture and Poland was their, their uh, line to the West become very important. And the great scholarship that occurs not on 20th century where one could not write freely in Poland, but on earlier periods, uh, that is a model when Ukraine is being so terribly persecuted in its scholarly activities. So all of this, I think, brings the wisdom of the 1990s, as I will call it. I mean, one of the, the great miracles of Polish-Ukrainian relations was that Poland was the first state to recognize independent Ukraine. Canada tried to be the first, but because of our problems, uh, Canada was second. But Canada, one expected to do this. But that Poland did this at this point, I think, showed that the Polish political class, and we must fully study this, understood that the independence of Ukraine was both just, 
but also that it was definitely in the interest of Poland. And from this point in view, I think we can argue that we have an acceptance of two states who accept a border which neither of them wants really, or would have wanted, uh, would have wanted a hundred years ago, but exists. And this I think is the great step forward. We also have the, the Poles with their traditions of insurrections and revolts against authoritarian pa powers being drawn into the Orange Revolution in 2004, into the Maidan. There was something in the Polish political culture that made them pro-Ukrainian and seeing that now the Cossack revolts were not against them, but uh, against uh, the potential oppressor uh, of, of the Russian empire. There is Poland as the model for integration into Europe. And I think Ukrainians wanted to follow. They didn't follow the economic model of Balcerowicz, uh, but they did follow in many ways the political model of knowing that NATO and European community should be their future. And there was the maturing of Ukraine that occurred during all of these events. Poland was a very different society, largely ethno-nationally uh, ethno Polish, uh, with a, a population determined to maintain a Polish state, even on new territories that had been uh, incorporated from former, former German populated lands, Ukraine was evolving into a national community and state with a far more diverse population as has been brought up of late on this. Uh, I would argue that both groups then began to accept things they couldn't accept before. I was in Lviv or Lviv when uh, the rededication of the Orlenta Cemetery was there. I must admit an elderly aunt of mine cried during that because she viewed it as a moment of shame, but others viewed it as a moment of bringing together, of recognizing not what the cause of the Polish or Lenta had been, but just their bravery and that for Poles they were important. And today when we hear Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, uh, a, a catchword which in the 1940s Poles would reject it, we see it's been recycled as has the Ukrainian dedication in a certain ways to the UPAS struggle. I would argue that a crucial to this, and I don't wanna overestimate the role of historians, have been historians and cultural figures have played a tremendous role. The nearness of the languages brings them together, the nearness of reading each other's literature. And for the first time, I can actually, when uh, Polish scholars write a book, say, you know, there's really a much better book on the Commonwealth in Ukrainian. And so if you've forgotten how to read Cyrillic, it's time you relearn it again, because by now Ukrainian scholarship is writing much more positive things about 16th century Commonwealth than some of Polish scholarship is. Uh, so there's been a tremendous birth of scholarship in Ukraine, which makes the countries more equal. Their cultures have come, and I in many ways closer together. Above all, they are brought together again by a clear threat, a threat which they have seen the failure of democratic Russia, the growth of an authoritarian Russia that lives with imperialist myths. And once again, if Ukrainians have now become the major devil for the empire and its imperialism, replacing Jews and Poles, uh, Poles are not that too far down the list as anyone who's read uh, Putin's screed understands. Uh, I think anyone who knows this knows that uh, we see in Russia today a fascistizing state uh, on the doorstep of both, well, on attacking Ukraine, invading Ukraine, but on the doorstep of Poland. Uh, never more has Poland's voice been important, important in the European community, particularly because of the certain foolishness, I would argue, of Germany in its security and other policies above all on energy, uh, but also a Poland that realizes that uh, Ukraine is important. Ukraine is fighting Poland's battle too. And on the other hand, a Ukraine that can turn to Poland uh, and find understanding. But I think in all of this, it's civil society that we give the credit to. It's not the historians, it's not the major politicians. It has been the population of Poland and the population of Ukraine that have brought those two states together. And so although we historians can still deal with all of the problems of the past, 
of varying interpretations, of varying disagreements, I think the people have shown us the path forward, and that is that Poland and Ukraine are linked for their future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. I think this is where I come in for a, a brief uh, couple of words. Uh, I broke off uh, at the partitions at the end of the 18th century uh, when uh, basically there were no national movements, no national, uh, no nationalisms in the in the modern sense uh, in any uh, uh, European nation. Uh, but in the course of the partitions, when there was no Polish state, no Ukrainian state, uh, both uh, communities developed national movements um, with ambitions uh, to create a state. And these two, um, uh, these two movements, Polish and Ukrainian, uh, worked in parallel uh, they were, they had uh, anti-Russian sentiment in common, uh, but essentially they were uh, rivals. They were mutually hostile national movements who when their uh, moment came at the end of the First World War, uh, of course they fell into conflict. And that conflict uh, lasted in various, on pleasant ways um, uh, long into the uh, 20th century. Uh, and I would uh, now argue that the conflicts between Poles and Ukrainians benefited only one, uh, uh, one, uh, one group, namely the Russians. Um, uh, Polish-Ukrainian divisions um, helped the, um, the perseverance of Russian and Soviet domination. Uh, but I must move on. Um, uh, the uh, sort of active uh, conflicts between Poles and Ukrainians came to an end uh, after the Second World War. Uh, Operation Vistula has not been mentioned but in 1947, but. Uh, a vicious campaign of ethnic cleansing, essentially, uh, in uh, southeastern post-war Poland. Um, but since then, you had uh, you had the People's Republic of Poland and the and Soviet Ukraine side by side, licking their wounds, reconstructing their uh, the fabric of their uh, nations and their and their society. Uh, and uh, the end of the Second World War is already 80 years ago. Um, uh, there's very, very few people alive today who can remember anything about it. They have, of course, historical memories, family memories, attitudes which, uh, which die hard, but uh, uh, I would like to finish by saying that um, uh, we've moved into a new era of new generations, both in Poland and Ukraine, and these new generations have new perspectives uh, where reconciliation and neighborliness uh, will take the front seat. Uh, and uh, I very much hope that this uh, the future for the two nations uh, is more favorable uh, than it was not too long ago. So thank you very much. Uh, we're very happy to answer questions, especially, especially historical questions, which um, may come up um, on topics we've not had time to mention. Thank Professor you. Professor Davis, Professor Sisson, thank you so much for your very interesting and promising remarks. And since we are not able to cover uh, the Polish and Ukrainian history and relations in a detailed manner, I think we'll, we should open the floor to the questions. And let me read out the first one. I 
I'm wondering if this uh, war was impro has improved Polish-Ukrainian relations or strained them with Poles taking in millions of Ukrainians. I think it was partially answered. We may, I think, talk about uh, if may if it may strain our relations. I mean, this taking in millions of Ukraine Ukrainians would like to take this question well i'll just say one thing uh, first of all the large number of ukrainians who had already come to poland are are what we have to remember in this it is not as if ukrainians are just arriving now uh, do we have 500,000 800,000 a million ukrainians now working and living in poland uh students studying all over and this has been going on for the past decade so in a certain way, those bridges have been formed with Polish society, I think, earlier. Uh, that also explains part of the ability to absorb these groups. Uh, many Ukrainians at, uh, not, uh, are not only arriving in Poland, they're also arriving with contacts, if not in Poland, then in Portugal and Spain and other such places. But I think that's already begun some of the changes. And then, of course, uh, the outpouring that we see uh, on just the level of the Polish population in the border areas, which is so stunning. Uh, and not only to say the wonderful organization of the mayors uh, of, of Warsaw, Krakow and the, and the major centers. Now, the question is whether Poland will be able to press the European community uh, to give the proper support Poland should receive for all it's done. And that I think we will see. Okay, thank you. Another question. Didn't freedom lobbying Cossacks sign over their independence to the Russian Tsar in 1654, Unia Pres uh, Pereslavska? Oh. That's very, Frank, go, go on. Yeah, so uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky took an oath to the Russian Tsar at a, at a rather poor point. First of all, there's no signature. There are a series of documents where uh, the suzerainty of the Russian Tsar is recognized. Very soon thereafter, Khmelnytsky uh, was renegotiating with the Swedes and by the end of his life with the Poles. So this is something Khmelnytsky is often criticized for. Moscow seemed very far away in 1654 and Khmelnytsky was in a difficult political situation. This is something, a, a major course of my studies. Uh, so, uh, uh, Khmelnytsky, by the way, had already uh, recognized the Turkish Sultan. Uh, Khmelnytsky was, in the 17th century, one of the most successful rebels, revolts, and uh, able to form a political entity. So uh, Shevchenko later said, uh, in the one poem that the Soviets never published, Oiti Bogdan Pjanni, uh, oh, you drunken Bogdan, you signed away our rights. It wasn't as simple as that. We can go back and forth into whether it was a wise move at that time, uh, but it was not seen as a uh, agreement forever. Regrettably, I must say, the Polish side was offering very little in 1654 other than war. Uh, it took a while for the Polish elite to come around to the idea that they would have to come to an accommodation with uh, Cossacks, with non-nobles, uh, and also uh, with the religious issue. Uh, so there was really little to offer from that side. Uh, you've answered my initial question about how historians from both sides have been reevaluating re their mutual history, example, AKOUN. But do you think this may one day extend to include Belarus? Keeping in, mind for, keeping in mind, for instance, the importance of Vilnius for Belarusian dissidents. Uh, I don't think that Belarus uh, is regarded, you know, part of the same uh, complex. Of course, if, if you're talking about wartime um, underground movements, well, the, uh, the home army, the AK was, uh, active both uh, you know in Lithuania and in in Belarus and uh, Ukraine, um, but I think these are complexities which are a bit beyond um, our present 
purview. Like one of the big questions is why um, the Ruthenians of Belarus didn't form uh, a nation along with the Ruthenians of Ukraine. That's you know, completely different from an earlier, earlier time. Um, uh, I think in the present situation, one of the big question marks is uh, what uh, is going to happen in Belarus after the uh, end of the uh, of Putin's war in Ukraine? Um, if Putin is uh, as unsuccessful as he looks like being, I think there's going to be an opening for a lot of discontent in Belarus, uh, which we all saw, already saw a couple of years ago, and is bubbling away somewhere under the surface. Um, Maybe if I can add just something, I, I, when I, I visited Vilnius for the first time, not too long ago, and suddenly realized how different it was from KU and Lviv, uh, because uh, there the, you have the massive churches built by the Ostrowskis and the great magnates of, and Vilnius was much closer to uh, a city where you had multicultural, multi-religious life in the old Commonwealth than either KU or Lviv, where the situations were quite different. But the, the one thing that, that, that strikes me is both Poles and Ukrainians have not paid enough attention uh, to Belarus in these last 30 years. Uh, fortunately, Belarus did develop. I mean, the, the, this magnificent movement they had against Lukashenko showed that Belarusians were able to organize and get a new conscious, uh, consciousness on it. And in that, uh, I think now we are sitting, we are seeing one, uh, the horrific ramifications of Putin being able to keep Lukashenko in power, which has allowed the Russians to attack Ukraine from the north. Uh, so Belarus proves now as a staging ground, extremely important. And then on the other hand, Belarusian uh, railroad workers tearing up tracks to try and stop it. So I, I think we see a, a, a new Belarus uh, on it and, and Belarus must be brought into any, any, any I think, discussions. Uh, Europe as well turned their back on Belarus and did sanctions, but did not really want to deal with this Lukashenko problem. How should Ukrainians and Poles approach difficult subjects such, such as massacres of civilian populations? Oh dear, this, but this it goes to the heart of um, many difficulties. Uh, I think the first thing uh, for people to remember is that uh, these massacres, atrocities, violence, were not one-sided. It's not just the story of one side oppressing the other. Uh, both sides were guilty at different periods of very unpleasant things, uh, and both sides uh, suffered greatly. Uh, and it's uh, the approach should be, as it were, from human suffering. That uh, there's surely a better way of um, uh, of uh, living together than uh, than attacking each other. That, that's the the first approach. Um, uh, the other thing uh, historians would be um, very conscious of is, is, is the different sources. Um, uh, uh, in order to uh, understand the, uh, the other person's side, you have to be able to uh, understand something of the sources which um, uh, give rise to different uh, attitudes. Uh, so, um, uh, Modesty, humbleness, uh, willingness to try and see the uh, the other side is the essence of uh, of a successful approach to very difficult matters. Do the speakers feel that the present generation of Polish politicians is able and willing to rise to the challenge? Yes. Who would like to answer that question? 
I think neither of us really. Um, uh, uh, you should ask my wife for uh, informed opinions about uh, the present Polish government. But um, what is clear is that the Polish government, as, a, as opposed to other elements in Poland, has rather lost its way. Um, uh, of course, nobody uh, was well prepared for what's happened. But uh, I think the Polish government has been um, uh, uh, particularly ill-prepared. Um, uh, I don't know what Frank might say about the, the extraordinary journey of the Polish Prime Minister and Vice Premier, who is actually the, the ruler of Poland, uh, to, uh, to Kiev a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, absolutely amazing that, that uh, a foreign government could ride through uh, Ukraine by train and not be um, uh, blocked or bombed by, by the Russians. It shows how very feeble is the reach of, of, of Russian control in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, also very clear, apart from expressing sympathy and support, it's not quite clear what that delegation was trying to do. Um, there are a couple of questions regarding the situation in the war right now, which I will skip or, you know, predicting what will happen. So, but let me stick to, to the history of the uh, Polish and Ukrainian relations. So to both, to both the speakers, first Ukraine, is there a sense of history in the people of the, of, of the people of Ukraine, of the USSR and force famine in, in the 30s, and, and a, corresponding, a corresponding opposition to the Russian and the second half of Poland. Is there a sense of history in the people of Poland of the USSR cutting massacre and a corresponding opposition to the Russian? So I, I will take the first because as, as it was mentioned earlier, I had a whole of the more project on the Ukrainian famine. Uh, what we have seen over the past 30 years is uh, an increasing importance uh, in all sociological surveys to the entire population of Ukraine placed on the Holodomor or famine. Uh, this has partially been due, uh, due to, first of all, the ability to speak publicly about it, secondly, the publication of sources, uh, particularly oral histories, which were still possible in the early 1990s, and then as well, government program and introduction into textbooks. So this has become a major issue and is of course one of the issues that uh, Moscow objects to, uh, uh, refusing to recognize it as a genocide. Uh, and we are now hearing, uh, to give an idea on the importance of history, is in the, in the areas where the Russian troops are occupying now, they are actually going into libraries that are not fully destroyed and taking out books dealing with Ukrainian historical topics they don't want. For anyone who thinks that this was not a planned uh, uh, action to undermine Ukrainianness throughout Ukraine. So Holo, the Holodomor has become a major unifying aspect throughout the various regions of Ukraine, including those regions in the West, which did not suffer or undergo it. And maybe Norman would take cotton in Poland. Yeah. Well, Katyn, um, uh, at one level, um, uh, I, I was going to say, uh, sort of knowledge of Katyn in the wider world, there was a long conspiracy of silence uh, to be. Uh, very honest about Katyn, which lasted until 1990, uh, until uh, Gorbachev finally um, uh, spilled the beans. And then, for example, the British Foreign Office um, uh, came clean, and, uh, but not entirely. Uh, um, the Katyn affair reflects very badly, of course, on Allied governments you know, not just on the perpetrators of the uh, uh, atrocity. Now, <clears throat> Polish sense of history, yes, uh, 
uh, I don't think I ever met a Pole who hadn't heard of Katyn. Um, it was one of the um, uh, symbolic events uh, that wasn't in the official history books, uh, unless it was put down as a German crime sometimes, uh, but it was something that everybody knew about. Uh, um, uh, a lot of the sense of history was maintained in families, uh, uh, not in, um, you know, uh, school lessons or um, in public spaces, uh, but it was something that was um, extremely well known uh, in Poland. <clears throat> uh, and it, it was something which attracted, you know, very severe punishment. Um, you could go for pri uh, to prison, for example, for owning a copy of the Katyn list, which had been uh, the list of names which was published in, in London soon after the war uh, and was um, searched you know, in every bag coming uh, it's through Polish customs for, for decades. Um, I think it's also true to say that uh, although uh, officially uh, in the West, uh, many governments didn't come exactly clear, the controversy was, was very well known. Uh, better known, for example, than the Holodomor, which was uh, something which had been successfully covered up in the 1930s uh, and remained a, a you know a very dark subject for uh, how long 50 years or, or so um, uh, so yeah Polish sense of history um, around Katyn was was pretty strong uh, in spite of uh, official opposition what has pitted Poles and Ukrainians against, against each other for centuries has been religion, Eastern versus Western Christianity. Has the recent political reapproachment informed relations between the churches? Oh, I would strongly oppose that. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, for, in Galicia, for example, where uh, you know the Polish and Ukrainian sphere overlapped, um, the uh, Ukrainians were predominantly Greek Catholics who um, had communion with the Roman Catholics. They could intermarry. There's a great deal of intermarriage, uh, and uh, there wasn't um, any great uh, religious conflict between. Roman Catholic Poles and um, Greek Catholic Ukrainians. In fact, my wife's family uh, were Polish Greek Catholics, uh, or rather, grand one grandfather was. Um, uh, and that shows that uh, that religious factor uh, was not um, a source of conflict, the source of conflict. The, um, the, the real re religious conflict was between the Greek Catholics in Galicia with the, the Russian and the Russian Orthodox. Um, there, there, there was a very strong religious character. Um, uh, I don't know what Frank would, would say about this, but um, uh, yeah. I feel, feel that uh, uh, religion as such was not the, the major factor in Polish-Ukrainian conflicts. Yeah, so uh, one, uh, as historians should do, I have a somewhat different vision of the relations of Greek Catholics and uh, Roman Catholics. Obviously, it, it became worse at the end of the 19th century as both churches got more involved in national movements. Uh, and uh, this then decreased uh, relations. Uh, so it varied, but of course, theoretically, that was within one religion, if two different rights. Mm. Uh, uh, and certainly, had it not been the strength of the Greek Catholic clergy who stood against Polonization and Polish movements and whatever, there would have been no Ukrainian movement in Galicia at the end of the 19th century. It was the Greek Catholic clergy and above all their families were the bastions of, if you, if you trace the Ukrainian intelligentsia in Galicia, 
almost always in the third or fourth generation, there's a priest in the family, right? Because these are the group that came over. The other side, which is, I think, of, of some interest, is uh, the relations. Uh, Ukraine has, is a multi-religious, multi-ethnic society in a way Poland is not. Uh, uh, Poland uh, uh, today. So they are, they are quite different at the moment. The Ukrainian movement had to be constructed overcoming the divide between Orthodox and Greek Catholics. Uh, and they are able to do so uh, very largely today, uh, although there is still a Moscow patriarchal church in Ukraine. And its future is very much in question. At the moment, 30 of the eparchies of the Moscow Patriarchate refused to mention Patriarch Kirill. I think the most important part of this has been the instrumentalization of the Russian Orthodox Church and Patriarch Kirill, the splits between Constantinople and Moscow now. So the Orthodox world is totally split and Moscow will not accept communion with Constantinople. Uh, and this is over the issue of the autocephaly or independence of the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. And this has just come to the fore with Patriarch Bartholomew's visit to Poland, uh, much received by the Polish government, because the Polish autocephalous Orthodox Church traces its autocephaly to 1924 from Constantinople. Indeed, to the very same act that Constantinople has just given to the Ukrainian church. The Polish Orthodox Church, as we know, has a very checkered past and relations with uh, various government security services and has been very slow at moving over to condemning the war, which it now is moving over to do, which is I find very interesting. And I think it's the pressure of Polish public opinion that is forcing this church, which has traditionally been very closely related to Moscow to move away from Moscow. Uh, as far as Roman Catholics and and uh, other groups uh, today with Poland. I think with Poland, there is no issue. The issues that remain are still the Archbishop of Lviv or Lviv and his relationship to the Greek Catholics. And this is largely because the Roman Catholics in general are used to playing first fiddle and the Greek Catholics should go after. Of course, in Ukraine where Greek Catholics are five or six times more numerous than Roman Catholics, this doesn't work as well. And so I think this is a certain problem for the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, finally, there's been pressure on the Vatican to, to mention the word Russian aggression and to mention the name. The Vatican says this is not in the, since the middle of the 19th century, the Vatican does not condemn aggressions by anyone specifically, uh, but we have seen Pope Francis somewhat moving on this. Uh, on the other hand, there, is still, there are still those who view the Jesuit dream of converting Moscow, uh, converting Russia as maybe playing a role in Pope Francis's thought. So uh, I, here, I don't think, it, I think the Polish hierarchy is together with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic and the Ukrainian Orthodox hierarchies on one side and the Vatican is maybe on another side. But someone who's studying it more carefully would have to look at the it changes by the week I see as this develops. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do Ukrainians today regard Petlura and his collaboration with with Pisutsky? I guess this goes back to me. Uh, generally, now I would say the Ukrainian patriotic forces are understanding of Petlura. Uh, and why he did it. I think this already began to heal uh, in the 1930s and 40s already. Obviously, there were many Western Ukrainians and particularly in the Ukrainian diaspora who viewed this as a great treason and the giving up of Western Ukraine to Poland. Uh, I don't think these are issues that move people in Ukraine today. Uh, so I think that there's, there is a general uh, you know, those who are interested in history and follow history, you know, see uh, Petlura in a difficult circumstance, trying to save the Ukrainian state and did what he had to do. Now, the question of attitudes towards Pilsudski are more complex, and I have not seen surveys on this. One of the strange parts of Ukrainian attitudes is the Movsky remains relatively unknown to Ukrainians. You know, the average Ukrainian has never heard of Domovsky. The average Ukrainian has heard of Pilsudsky. Uh, 
The other reason Pilsudski may now have a somewhat better name than he would have had uh, uh, 30 years ago is as knowledge has come out on the whole, the more, more and more comes out of Stalin's statements against Petlura and Pilsudski. And because of Stalin condemning them, obviously those people who oppose Stalin and, and, and the Holdemar policies see Pilsudski in a somewhat more positive light. But I would not argue that there's deep knowledge in general society. It, it, the question is how much in others. Is. Uh, my comment is a bit different. It would be about uh, British uh, opinion or British no knowledge of history, the um, alliance between Pilsudski and Petlura is hardly known even by professional historians. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you an anecdote where, and, uh, when I published, as you mentioned, Marek, uh, this book on the Polish-Soviet War of 1919-20 to 20, uh, in 1972, uh, the, um, the foreword was written by my uh, tutor, A.J.P. Taylor, who was just about the best known historian in the English speaking world at the time. And he didn't know uh, that um, Poland had been uh, allied with Ukraine or that there was an independent Ukraine in 1920. And what he wrote in the foreword didn't agree with what I wrote in the text. Uh, and most people, most people didn't know uh, that there was an independent Ukraine between 1917 and 1921. In fact, when um, the Polish army uh, marched into Kiev in April 1920, there was a European-wide movement fomented by the Vol Bolsheviks called Hands, Hands Off Russia. Uh, and uh, the future British Foreign Secretary, Ernie Bevin, uh, who was then a trade union leader, led a big protest in London under the banner of Hands Off Russia, not knowing that Kiev was not in Russia, that Kiev, in fact, was in an independent Ukraine. So uh, what do you do? Um, uh, knowledge about these parts in, uh, in uh, foreign opinion is very weak and it can be very weak uh, among professional historians. Frank and I do our best. <laughs> okay, I think uh, these were all the questions, pertinent questions, uh, because there were a couple you know, questions for your comments about the current situation in Ukraine, which I think we should skip here and not <laughs> military strategies or political commentators. Uh, there is also a question, maybe you want to handle that, two similar questions. Will you, UPA continue to to be a guiding light for the independent Ukraine after the war is over or how we should view Bandera? Okay, so this is- That's the fi two final questions. <laughs> uh, so as I said, or, or tried to say in this rather quick discussion, for most Ukrainians today, UPA is a symbol of resistance to alien rule and national liberation struggle. Uh, the uh, life experience of most people is the resistance from 44 to 51 or two. Uh, so in that sense, uh, UPA, I think, will remain uh, positive in the eyes of many Ukrainians for that struggle. Uh, they have to, I think, as we discussed earlier and Norman discussed earlier, we must confront people with all of the data uh, all of the material of what we have about these movements uh, and deal with what are negative and positive sides of them. Uh, so uh, I, uh, it is hard to say what will emerge in Ukraine. Obviously, if Putin is successful, uh, God forbid, uh, there, well, we know what the version of history will be. Uh, then the, the, the peculiar situation of Bandera, uh, 
which is, I think, a very interesting one within, uh, uh, within uh, historical mythology. Uh, here you have Bandera, who during, after the proclamation of, of uh, Ukrainian statehood on the 30th of June, 1941, winds up under house arrest by the Germans through most of the war and is therefore outside of most of the activities and then winds up in the West. Uh, Bandera became a symbol in the same way of terminology uh, within the Soviet Union uh, that once Mazepists were. If you were in the, in the 19th century and you wanted to condemn Ukrainians for disloyalty to the Russian state and to the Russian cause, they were called Mazepis. That continues down to the First World War. And in Stalin's Soviet Union, uh, a similar person is called a Petlerite, a Petlurist. Now, these people often, just as the late 19th century people had nothing to do with uh, uh, Mazepa, uh, many of these people uh, had, who are being arrested in the 1930s and 40s and 50s had nothing to do with the actual person Petlura. It may not have been, but it became just a word used for Ukrainian patriot. What the Soviets managed to do after World War II is turn the term Banderite into the similar term. If you spoke Ukrainian publicly, you were called a Banderite. If you uh, showed too much dedication to Ukrainian cause, you were a Banderivitz. In so doing, they turned uh, uh, the name of a person, and not even of a movement in this case, into something that just meant a good Ukrainian. And that I think played a major role in uh, what might be called uh, the cult of Bandera as it exists. Uh, the question is, uh, does the Banderite ideology, does the ON ideology of the 1930s fit contemporary democratic Ukraine. This is, that, that ideology does not clearly uh, the, in, into a more open society. As you know, the parties of the right in Ukraine uh, draw very few votes in any of these elections. On the other hand, uh, in this way, I think the, the post-Stalinist and post-Stalinist regime were successful in changing the term Banderite. Comparable is, and I think important in this, is uh, Slava Ukraini, Slava Heroya, uh, the, the symbols of UPA. The other discussions are uh, now about the red and black flag, right? Which has now been almost viewed as a, a battle flag for Ukrainian independence and not necessarily associated with the UPA. What I think in the long run is that stable Ukrainian and Polish states, uh, which have relative security, will open up to much more intricate historical discussions that will go beyond certain groups. The other is, uh, as a historian, uh, much attention is paid to ideology and not to general society and why groups join them. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that most of the 14, 15, and 16-year-olds in Ukrainian gymnasia and Galicia of the 1930s, I do not think were well-read in ON ideology, ideological tracks. What they knew was that the only resistance against the Polish regime that was, seemed effective was from the ON, which was organizing them. Uh, and uh, so I think we have to divide ideologies on that. So it remains to be seen if, of course, it, as, as this war comes to, comes to an end. Okay. Um, could I add a word? Um, uh, not, not an area of my uh, expertise, but uh, I, I, there's several things to say. What well, one, I agree strongly with Frank that Banderas, uh, become a sort of general a, a term of generalized abuse um, or because uh, if you're on the Ukrainian side a sort of gen generalized uh, champion of, of the nation irrespective of, of who he was or what he did 
<clears throat> uh, the second thing is, uh, which Poles must remember, is that there were several groups in Poland with similar right radical views, uh, like that of uh, OUN uh, among the Ukrainians. Uh, Bandera wasn't sort of unique in that form of um, right radical politics. And the other thing, uh, and Frank rightly said, uh, during most of the, <clears throat> the Second World War, Bandera was not on the scene at all. He, he was arrested by the, by the Germans and was not active. Uh, and this gave rise, uh, as far as I know, to several cliques and factions in the um, UPA, uh, not all of whom um, agreed with the same uh, actions. Poles are most interested with the atrocities in Volhynia and, uh, and East Galicia, uh, but that wasn't the personal uh, work of Bandera. Bandera. There were other people there uh, with um, extreme views who um, can be, you know, personally condemned for their part in that, but it's um, uh, OUN, OUN, like the uh, Polish ACA, was a federation of several groups, uh, not, of all, not all of whom had the same uh, ideological uh, ideas. Okay. Thank you so much for this interesting uh, lecture remarks. And uh, I would like to encourage those who live in the UK to support the project on Poland and Poland past and present, uh, which was funded by Professor Davis. And those in the US, please support the Kosciuszko Foundation. Again, thank you so much. Thank you.